I'm Hemant Smetso. And I'm Jessica Blimke. And you're listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. We're brought today by Be Secular. Be free to love. Be able to choose. Be accepted no matter your race, gender, sexual orientation, or belief system. Be Secular. Be Secular merchandise allows you to display your support for equality and the separation of church and state, while also donating up to 50% of the profit from your purchase to nonprofits, groups, and artists that support those same values. Go to www.besecular.com. Pick your item and then choose who you want to get the donation from your sale. Listeners of this podcast will get a 10% discount if they use the promo code FRIENDLY. Make a statement. Be you. Be secular. Phil Zuckerman is a professor of sociology and secular studies. Yes, secular studies at Pitzer College in Claremont, California, where he lives with his wife and children. He is the author of several books about atheism, including Society Without God and Faith No More, Why People Reject Religion. Later this year, he'll be releasing a book called Living the Secular Life. Phil, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Okay, so I have to ask about this secular studies program. Does that mean, like, I can major in atheism now? What is that all about? Okay, you cannot major in atheism, but you can major in secular studies. So, uh, basically, uh, it's the first program in the country that allows students to take classes with a focus on the secular. Secular philosophy, secular you know, demographics, secular culture, secularism, church-state issues. So we have courses in sociology, political science, history, philosophy, and, and, and so, yeah, you can... You can um, this is, it's exciting. We've got about six faculty that are affiliated with the program. We have had our first major graduate last year. We, we're going to have another one graduating this year. Um, it's a really, you know, Pitzer's an innovative little college, and we were able to, to cobble this together over several years and finally get it approved. And so some of the classes focus on atheism, but other classes don't. For example, I'm teaching a class right now that looks at secular movements all over the world, from India to, to, to Scandinavia to Jamaica itself to France. So, yeah, that's secular studies. How many classes do you have to take to get that major? You take nine classes plus a capstone project or thesis. And of those nine classes, two or three actually have to be in religious studies. So we, we don't see right. secular studies as something, you know, against religious studies, we see them as very complementary, very much overlapping. So we want students to have a good understanding of religion as well, but what's happened in the past is so many students who have an interest in atheism, agnosticism, humanism, secularism, church-state issues, had no options other than religious studies. And so while one or two of those classes might be interesting, you know, a class on Nietzsche or something, they were having to take a lot of stuff that really wasn't their passion, you know, church history or stuff on the scriptures or whatnot. Sure. And this way, students uh, who are interested in religion but are also interested in secularism mm-hmm. have a major that's really much more in tune with their uh, passion. So when you were starting to uh, piece this together and launch it, what kind of reaction were you getting from people? Did you, was it largely positive or were people kind of side-eyeing you? I would say it was overwhelmingly positive, um, or either positive or just head scratchers. You know, <laughs> people were like, "Huh?" So we had a lot of head scratching, and and we took that as an opportunity to say, "Well, we bear the burden of of explaining what this whole uh, endeavor is about." You know, a lot of people said, "Well." What's wrong with religious studies? And we said, you know, hey, religious studies is fantastic, but mm-hmm. we've been studying religious life from every angle for 150 years. You know, anthropology has been studying religion, sociology, psychology, philosophy, and that's great, and we need to do that. But there's a huge swath of humanity that is secular of varying shades, and we have not been studying them. There's, obviously, there's always been stuff in philosophy going back uh, to, to, to the Charvaka of India or the or Greeks and the Romans, but... But and, and so philosophers have always been aware of you know God debates and whatnot. But what have not? Who hasn't really paid any attention to social science, so psychology of of irreligion, sociology, anthropology, political science? This is where there's been a huge lacuna, and so most people were quite excited. I had a professor of history that was excited. You know, basically what happened is there were several of us who were already teaching courses that were, you know, feeding into this uh, common interest of focusing on the secular, where, whether it be, uh, you know, secular movements or secular culture, and we were able to pull it together. So, you know, we had some people who were a bit uh, slightly negative, but, you know, what would, what would academia be without 
people saying no. So. <laughs> yeah, people complaining at a university never. <laughs> is this program is this program going to spread to other colleges? You know, I certainly hope so. I know that in England, a school uh, opened up and a sort of anthropological focus that they called religion and secularism. So they've kind of mm. broadened their scope. Um, I know that uh, uh, the front page of the Chronicle of Higher Ed, I think uh, the last Chronicle of Higher Education, featured an essay by Jacques Berlinerblauer at Georgetown about sort of the state of secular studies. So we know that courses are exploding. So people are offering courses all across the spectrum like never before, classes on atheism, humanism, secularism. They, this is huge. This is booming. Whether these courses will uh, uh, you know, morph into actual departments has yet to be seen. And, you know, there's pros and cons, but I, I am hoping that it develops and catches on. That's a huge demographic that, yeah, we don't study in an academic contest as, yeah. uh, context as much. Exactly. I mean, just to give you a quick example, in my class, Secularism Local Global, I'm, I'm giving some lectures on, on Af- secularists and secularism in Africa. There's mm. no research. It's like an empty, you know, and yet I'm finding rates of irreligion, some surveys in places in Africa that are higher than in some states in the United States. Mm. You know, there's some countries with 11 percent, 12 percent of the, the population saying they have no religion. And, and this is higher than Mississippi. So, yeah, there's there's. You know, there's so much out there that we just have yet to study. So that's our hope that we'll get to that. I'm curious what your thoughts are regarding teaching religion to a younger audience. So say high school. Do you think it's possible for a high school curriculum to be, I don't want to say trusted, that's not the right word, but but can teachers objectively present? Because I I personally think it would be extremely valuable. to learn about religion. To learn about what... Christianity is if you don't know yeah. what you know what Islam is all that do you think that's something that we we should see at a younger age or do you think it's viable I I think it definitely should be taught I think the world religions the history the foundational stories uh, the the you know demographics uh, I think it's so important for students to learn about the world of religion and, and religions um, whether it's viable is tricky, you know. I think you're, it's very tough in high school to you tread a very fine line, and the potential to offend is so huge when you mm-hmm. get to things like religion. You know, uh, what, what's the teacher supposed to do, for example, in talking about the history of Christianity? Now, right. do they give the Christian version, or do they give the <laughs> Richard Carrier version, you know? I mean, it's, 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 it's tough. It's like... Uh, I always say, you know, when you go to like a, a Borders or Barnes and Noble's bookstore, you know, they have like the mythology section, and you'll see like, oh, the Greek myths and the uh-huh. Nordic gods, and then there's like the Christianity section, you know. And I say to my students, like, well, wait a minute, how do you? <laughs> Why do you is that a different section? <laughs> yeah, so it's tricky. I so I would, my heart would go out to to any professor, whether they were secular or religious. I could imagine a religious uh, uh, teacher of high school really having a tough time, wanting to appease everybody, mm-hmm. and I could imagine a secular. Uh, instructor at high school also. So my sense would be it is tough, but just because it's tough doesn't mean we should then uh, shirk uh, away from it. So I would love to see a kind of viable, um, uh, 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 unbiased, if possible, approach to teaching the world religions in high school. Um, Yeah, I think it's, why not? Do you know if you have any religious students who are majoring in secular studies? That's a good question. You know, we don't have a lot of majors so far for the simple reason that, you know, we're a small liberal arts college. We only have 900 students uh, oh, wow. full-time. Um, so it is a small little school, and most students who aren't going to major in secular studies because of the pressure of, you know, what am I going to tell my folks? They're going to think I'm nuts, and how, what am I gonna, how am I going to get a job here? Yeah. So what the two students that have majored in so far have double majored. So actually the current student who's about to graduate this spring, she's a double major in social and secular studies, and the first person to get a major and graduate with a major was Will Holt, and he double majored in secular studies and religious studies, which I just thought was so powerful and so awesome. Oh. I hope he has <laughs> a job somewhere <laughs> <laughs> otherwise. Pitzer, Pitzer doesn't um, doesn't actually have a lot of religious students. We we don't draw from that uh, pool so much. You know, there's an emphasis on social justice, environmental justice, gay rights, women's rights, um, um, and we get it. So it's a very progressive school. It's on the West Coast. It's just outside of Los Angeles. So we get a lot of people from you know Seattle, San Francisco, Portland. I mean, it's not it's not you know I wouldn't say it's a cross section of America by any means. Mm-hmm. So it just in general, we don't get a lot of 
uh, at least outspokenly religious students in any of our classes. But uh, I definitely have them taking my classes. Uh, they don't major in it, but in my class right now, I know I have at least four or five out of 25 students who are you know, expressly Christian mm-hmm. and others who sort of are spiritual and religious. So we do get some, uh, but those students generally aren't choosing to major in it yet. So let's talk about uh, something very different, which is we have seen so many stories in the past few years about the rise of the nuns and how this demographic of unaffiliated people, which, yes, that's atheists and agnostics, but it also includes people who are like spiritual but not religious, Uh Christians who don't Mm. like the word Christian, whatever. (laughs) We've seen that number rise. So a couple questions. One, why are we seeing that trend? What do you attribute that to? And also, do you think that number is going to keep growing, or have we seen the plateau? Ah, well, I'll take the second question first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, as, you know, as you know, because that's a little bit quicker. So, as you know, back in the 70s, you know, less than 5% of Americans said they had no religion. In the 1990s, that was up to maybe 8 7%, 8%. Big news in 2001 when it hit 14%. Front page news on CNN, big deal, right? Then every year since, it's gone up about 1% or 2 percentage points. So then, you know, Pew Forum found it at 16% in 2010, I think, or 11. Now we're up to 20%. And, that, and then among Americans that are under 30, between 18 and 29, it's at 33%. So You're welcome. We're seeing, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what? It's true. I have, You're not you even have there anymore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yes, indeed. Yes, you should get a, a special prize. Okay. I, no, I should. Hammond's 31. I'm 29. I get the prize. You You're go. welcome, America. You um, so I would say that we. this is a, you know, Time Magazine called this one of the top trends changing American society. I mean, you just don't see that kind of a rise in any demographic, you know, whether we're talking linguistic groups or religious groups or political movements. I mean, it's a huge, huge uptick. In Take that, so, Mormons. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's true. <laughs> Man, I love it. Um, indeed. So I think uh, I think um, that the, the basically the question is, if I had to look at all things staying the same, I see no reason why this would stop. Like I think it will keep upticking. I don't mm-hmm. think it will ever just you know go all the way to 100 percent. Religion has uh, too many functions for people. It has psychological benefits, communal benefits, rich, uh, traditional. I mean, there's there's too much that religion addresses in human lives. I don't ever see it disappearing. I don't ever see. I don't think we're ever going to get to you know 85 percent saying they have no religion in in my lifetime. Maybe mm-hmm. in Jessica's, but I don't think you know <laughs> that. that I, I don't know. So is it? I think it will at some point plateau, but, you know, we don't have enough data to to say this because this is so new. Mm -hmm. We've never seen rates of secularity this big as we have in the last 25 or 50 years. You you know, in Britain, we've seen an absolute plummeting of Christianity, unprecedented. So some sociologists over there, like Steve Bruce, Colin Brown, are saying, you know, Christianity is going to be dead in 25 years. So they're they're actually not just saying like, oh, you know, okay, 30% hovering Mm -hmm. at no religion. They're they're thinking it's going to go higher and higher and higher. So I, I have to say, if I had to bet, I think it's going to keep going up. But I do think it should plateau at some point. And that, so that's the, the, for the first question. That's the best I can do. Okay. Um, not, not that, I, you know, without a crystal ball, it's the best I could say. I don't think we've reached a plateau. I think we will at some point. I'll take 51%. Um, that would be oh, fine that, with me. Yeah, <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, the other question is why this is happening. Um, I write a lot. I, I have a whole chunk of chapter on my new book, Living the Secular Life, addressed to this specifically called, you know, irre- uh, the rise of ir- irreligion rising, I call it. Mm-hmm. And I try to go through it. So I'll just give you the quick, quick version here. Um, you know, every society. Many societies have secularized in the last 75 years. Japan has secularized tremendously. We're even seeing an uptick of irreligiosity, irreligi- irreligiosity in places like Brazil. Um, so uh, we're seeing uh, rates of irreligion in Jamaica. We're seeing rates of irreligion uh, uh, going up almost everywhere, except there's a few places where it's not, and we can talk about that. So the, the truth is every society has its own unique history, it, it, its own unique religious context within, against which you know, secularism grasps with, dances with, or fights against. So there's, uh, it's hard to talk about like a grand unifying reason that, that all societies will, 
will secularize. If we, if we had to, though, we could say, you know, increased education, better living conditions, those seem to be the, the, the universal, increased internet usage seems to be correlated. Those things aside, if I had to specifically look at the United States and say, okay, what's going on here in the last 25 years, I would have to say the following. So, and this is not in any particular order, but, you know, number one, actually the success of the religious Right, the Christian right, uh, that welding of conservative politics with evangelical Christianity, that, that blending, mm -hmm. has actually turned a lot of people off. So you're kind of moderate Christians, you're, you know, your average, you know, Episcopalian or kind of Methodist or whatever, they're suddenly like, whoa, if that, if that's what Christianity means, you know, they're thinking Ann Coulter, Sean Hannity, uh, 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 Rick Santorum, you know, <laughs> Newt Gingrich, if this is Christianity, hey, I want nothing to do with this. So they're actually preferring to opt out and actually stop calling themselves Christian rather than be associated with this uh, strong Christian right, which is actually weakening now, but has been so strong. So, atheist, so the whole think, atheist movement should be giving, paying a huge debt of gratitude to Jerry Falwell. <laughs> exactly. Thanks, indeed. <laughs> well, so, yeah, there's been quite a backlash in a sense. A real, uh, it's been kind of consciousness raising. I think a lot of people have said, wait a minute, I don't like this. You know, I, didn't, I don't support these particular policies. And yet it seems to be that Christian Republicans are the ones trumpeting this. So I think a backlash against the Christian right, we have some data on that. Number two, there's been a, another backlash against the uh, Catholic pedophile priest scandals. Yeah. Uh, we see a lot of data from New England, Massachusetts area, Boston area. A lot of Catholics were horrified and pissed off and said, you know what? I don't want to be identified anymore. So rates of Catholic self-identification have plummeted in the wake of the, uh, you know, of the media attention focused on these horrific uh, pedophile scandals. Now, those two both have to do something with religion, you know, a reaction against the Christian right, a reaction mm -hmm. against pedophile priests. A third variable, though, that not many people are talking about is we see wherever rates of women working outside the home in the paid labor force go up, religiosity tends to go down. Why is that? And this, cor this correlation is very strong in country after country. What do we see in the United States? You know, 25, 30 years ago, less than... 12% of households uh, were headed by a female breadwinner. Today we're at 40%. 40% of American households have a, a woman who's either the top breadwinner or the sole breadwinner. Mm -hmm. um, this simply could be a sociological fact that, you know what, when women are outside, working outside the home, they do not have the time or energy to keep religion going in their homes, or they have more agency in life and don't need religion anymore. You know, they have uh, more power, more control. So something's going on with women in the paid labor force. So Is that because three, women kind of set the tone for the religion in the household? That seems to be the theory. So the idea is, at least in the last, you know, hundred or so years, um, and Callum Brown wrote a great book called The Death of Christian Britain. He's the one that really broke this story, so to speak. The argument is that, you know, religion has and it's certainly the case in the African American community, as C.Q. Bu Hutchinson talks about this. You know, it becomes women's role to be the kind of the pious one, the the one getting the kids to say their prayers at night, getting the family to go to church. And the Simpsons got this right. You know, it's uh, it's always Marge. You know, Marge is the one that wants to go to church. None of the kids <laughs> want it, and Homer doesn't want to. And so, you know, they'll go kicking and screaming. They'll drag their feet, but Marge is kind of like the religious pillar there of the family. And that seems to be the case in a lot of homes, um, even in your most patriarchal religious traditions, women, it seems to be women's work to enforce and, and, and uphold religiosity and piety in the home and make sure their kids get it. So, yeah, it, the theory seems to be, you know what, when women stop playing that role, mm -hmm. either through fatigue or disinterest, mm -hmm. um, no, the kids, the husband, kind of, no one, you know, they follow suit. So, you know, that's, that's one possibility. And, I, and I'd say that the other three in our country specifically are, there's no question the rise of the Internet, and that, that plays mm -hmm. itself out in many levels, which we can get into, but that seems to be correlated with increased secularity. I also think the increased uh, embracing of gay rights and the coming out of gays and lesbians, which so many younger people have accepted, and the only opponents, you know, to the only people hostile to gay rights and gay marriage are the religious. I mean, there, right. there's no secular organized battle against gay rights or gay marriage. It's only religious. And so a lot of younger people are just like, you know what? This, we don't buy it, and it's turning a lot of people off, a lot of younger people off of religion because they accept gay rights, they're gay and lesbian friends, or mm -hmm. selves, or cousins, or whatnot, and that seems to trump their allegiance to a religion which is condemning uh, our brothers and sisters on this front. And, uh, and then finally, I don't have a lot of data on this, but I have to say 
the, the sort of impi- the successful religion bashing we see on TV, from John Stewart to Bill Maher to <laughs> Stephen Colbert yeah. to, to Family Guy to House to you name it to The Simpsons. I mean, it, it has to have had a. I mean, I can't prove this. I'm not a media studies <laughs> expert, but you know, fifteen, ten, nine, eight, five years of these being such popular shows, you gotta wonder. I mean, is it just reflecting something, or is it actually instigating something? So I think if you take all these six factors together, that probably helps explain. And then, of course, finally, the seventh would be, you know, reaction against 9-11. I mean, <laughs> let's, let's be honest there. That, turned, that pissed a lot of people off. And yes, it sort of it focused on Islam, but I think in general it also got some people thinking about, you know, hey, religion can be pretty wacky and it can be pretty damaging, and, and I'm going to, you know, be a bit more critical. So I think you just said atheism guess. got the Colbert bump. <laughs> atheism got the Colbert bump. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. What do you think of all that? I mean, I I personally, I, I I think people around around my age, I honestly think that the gay rights thing and I, the yeah. birth control thing and yeah. the, the culture wars, the culture war, the kind yeah. of anti woman sentiment that comes yeah. from a lot of Christianity. It's like what what's what's there for me? Yeah. Like my yeah. my best friend is gay. I am on birth control, right. and I am a lady person who would like <laughs> to like be in charge of that area. And, and, That's like, right. Just get out of my face yeah. with that. And I think more people it's were willing true. to be, and the internet's part of this. They were more willing to be out there as atheists, and yeah. it's a lot harder to demonize someone you know. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. That's right. So. That's right. It's right. It snowballs. The more people that come out, the more people come out. I mean, it's just, but you know that thing. It's such you know the fact that. 18 to 29 year olds in America today are the least homophobic cohort we've ever had right. and are simultaneously the least religious. That, that could be a coincidence. Yeah. I don't think so. Well, I don't think so. And things like Glee, which I know is not a super current reference, but here mm-hmm. I go anyway. Um, a few years ago, when they have a predominantly gay character, and I don't know if you remember this, I covered it on the site when Victoria Jackson went on. I'm sure I, I presume Fox News, yeah, and was okay. just like, "Oh, it's icky!" Like she just was making a face at it, uh, which, frankly, I'm sure a lot of people feel that way, especially older white guys, older conservative, yeah, generation. older older yeah. conservative yeah. people yeah. feel that way. But she was roundly mocked for it because now that is not like it's not acceptable dialogue to right. say That's right. gays. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and yeah, good. I think it's right. True. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. So, Phil, you lived in Denmark for a couple of years, I understand, which is nothing if not pretty damn secular. Um, yeah. What are some of the differences that you saw there? Um, like, how is religion treated there overall? Um, like your grandma's old Victrola. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, like a cool, neat, old, quaint record player that you don't really know what to do with it, but it's okay. <laughs> you don't want to see it. You know, it, it, that, I think, was... You know, yeah, I lived in, in Scandinavia, in Denmark for two years, and mm-hmm. I would say that some of the biggest differences were religion is so marginal to daily life there. It is so excluded from political power there mm-hmm. that, that your average Dane thinks it's just kind of quaint. I mean, they, they, they like, don't— Like, oh, you're religious? That's adorable. Oh, that's, that's so about cute. it. Yeah. It's like, like, I think for your average secular person in America or your average atheist in America, you know, religion's kind of like a shark in the water. Like, it's dangerous— yeah. It's it's it can be very it, you have to like you know fight it. Keep you it have to check. be aware of where it is at all times. Yeah, I think in Denmark religions like a, a goldfish and a guppy. You know, like oh yeah, it's like their uncle's uh, fish tank or something. Like it just doesn't have the political power. Yeah. It doesn't have. It's not. There's, it's not dominating school boards. It's not dominating sports events. It's not limiting women's rights to control their re- reproductive selves. It's not fighting. You know, all the stuff that we see here is just absent there. So there's actually more of a kind of like benign indifference to religion rather than a hostility to it or you know um, um, anger at it. And and I and that was very interesting for me to see. And in, in a sense, you know, Steve Bruce, I mentioned him earlier from Scotland. He's a sociologist. He says, you know, the final endpoint. A, a truly secular society is not atheism, but indifference, if that mm. makes sense. So, in other words, I actually find that American atheists and agnostics, I mean, we we are still very much 
interested in religion. We care about it. We read about it on the news. We have no choice. (laughs) We have no, exactly. We have got to, you know, we are watching, you know, we are going every day to the friendly alienist and looking at what's happening at this high school. Yeah, they are. (laughs) You know, we are, when we go to Huffington Post, we click the religion thing. Whereas, so we are knowledgeable about religion, we care about it, and so in effect we are still dancing with it. Yeah. Whereas in Scandinavia, or particularly Denmark, where I was living, religion is so weak and marginal, people are actually kind of just oblivious to it and indifferent to it, so much so they don't even have strong feelings against it. And I, I just found that quite quite fascinating. I feel like it, the way you talk about it kind of reminds me of growing up, I would I read a lot of Greek mythology. I was really into it for some reason. Mm-hmm. I, I, is, is that a fair comparison to make that that's how they treat that they it. They treat it kind of the way we treat like Greek mythology. You like, bet. isn't that adorable that people thought they lived on a mountain? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, exactly. Like my average, you know, my average interviewee would say, you know, I'd ask him about Jesus, and they'd say, "Oh, he was a nice man," <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I'd say, and I'd say, "Well, do, do you believe he's the son of God?" Oh, well, no, that's just an old story. You know? Do you nice. believe he, you know, was born of a virgin? Oh, nobody believes that. He just taught some really great things. And then you'd say, like, well, like what? And they'd say, well, you know, <laughs> be a good person. I mean, um, what do they, they think they, about you then? I mean, what do they think about Americans? Because they got to believe we're crazy then. I think they're not you wrong. You know what? It's <laughs> interesting. I, I'll tell you, I got one anecdote there. While I was living there my first year, uh, I became friends with a colleague I- I- at the university, and I got to know her husband quite well. He worked in telecommunications, and I interviewed him in Denmark, and he identified as Christian in Denmark, hmm. as most Danes will. It's just kind of like a cultural demar- uh, demarcation. It's kind of an ethnicity almost, you know, being Lutheran. But, you know, in terms of beliefs, he, you know, didn't really believe the stuff literally, but still considered, you know, Jesus a good guy, and maybe there's a God, maybe there isn't, who could say Interestingly enough, his wife got a sabbatical at Santa Barbara, which is just a couple hours away from us. So they came the next year to the United States. He'd never lived in the United States before. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and he had the sort of semester off while his wife was working, so he volunteered at his kids' schools. He really just, like, wanted to soak up American culture. And this is Santa Barbara. We're not even talking, you know, <laughs> Nashville or, you know, Little Rock. This is Santa Barbara. <laughs> he came to me and said, oh, I, I had no idea. He was traumatized, <laughs> wow. terrified by the by the Christianity, and he went home and renounced his membership in the Danish <laughs> Lutheran Church wow. and is now an out atheist. So you know, he was like, and he said to me, he goes, "I don't think Danes know just how you know religious Americans actually Someone are." Someone take I this guy I, to Alabama. <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. So they those those that know they do find it troubling, but I think a lot of them aren't. Or in a bit of denial. I don't think they really think mm-hmm. it's, it's that fundamentalist as it can be here. But but they're very troubled by that notion. Sure. They do not. There was a survey, uh, an international uh, uh, world value survey, where it asked populations like, "Do you want your politicians to be religious?" Denmark came in last place. So I mean, they're very <laughs> they're Smart very suspicious days. of any. You know, but so it's, it's, it's a, it was a fascinating two years, and I can't wait to go back. Um, Phil, come to, sh- to uh, change gears, I know you have a book coming out uh, later this year, uh, Living the Secular Life. When is that coming out? It comes out December 4th. December 4th. So We'll hype it on the site. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, thank you. So as this is actually going to be kind of a question for Hammett, too, as the only person on this call who has not written a book. <laughs> Get with the program. I know. What have I been doing? <laughs> so, and and definitely is you know I I am a writer. That's something I've kind of kicked around, wanting to do. And I find my personal struggle is like, wh- what is there left to say? You know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's okay. a lot of atheism books, a lot of secular books. Um, when you sit down to write a book, Phil, what are you? Do you see a gap you need to fill? Is that your motivation? Um. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I think for every book I've written, it was because there was something I was genuinely interested in, and I kind of would write the book that I wish was out there, that I want to read in a sense, you uh-huh. know? Um, and so, yeah, in, 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 in Society Without God, I'm driving on in the car, listening to the radio. George Bush has just been elected to his second presidency, and everybody's talking about values voters, and I'm thinking mm-hmm. values uh, you know, what what values you're referring to. And, and in fact, the least religious societies on earth have much better values than we right. do. So I sort of, you know, and then with the faith no more, it was like, wow, 
people are this rise of the nuns is picking up. Well, but how does it actually? Ha- like, there's all this stuff on secularization about the macro level and the historical level. But how do people who actually believe this stuff? What? How does it? How do they stop believing it? So mm-hmm. I sat down and interviewed people. I really just genuinely wanted to hear those stories. With my new book, Living the Secular Life, there, there were two things that I felt like needed to be addressed. So number one, okay, everybody's talking about the rise of the nuns, the, uh, the, the rise of secularism in America, the rise of every religion, and it's, so it's news. Mm-hmm. But what no one is saying is it's actually good news. Th- this is not just a sort of neutral trend we're seeing. It is really good for America, and I want people to understand why. You know, there's plenty of people saying it's bad for America. You know, we got Newt Gingrich saying, you know, school shootings are the inevitable result of secularism, and we've got uh, 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 Mike Huckabee saying people who, you know, <laughs> say it again? He, sa- he said to his fourth wife. Exactly. <laughs> Indeed. And, you know, we've got Mike Huckabee saying, oh, people who don't hear the voice of God shouldn't be in our halls of government. I mean, there's plenty of people saying religion is necessary for a good society, and so secularism is something to be worried about. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to say, um, actually, The data shows that where societies become more secular, they seem to be thriving. They're the most successful societies in terms of prosperity, equality, freedoms, uh, freedom of speech. You know, the the, the healthiest societies in the world today have gone through an organic secularizing process. By organic, I mean it wasn't forced by some Stalinist dictator, but like the people themselves have just kind of stopped having much interest in religion. They're doing really well. And we see that the least theistic states in our country, the top ten least theistic states, are also among the, the best states in in the country, whereas, you know, the most religious states are faring the worst. So there's sort of a macro picture, but on the individual level as well, there are key attributes that secular people exhibit, certain values, certain orientations, certain precepts that are good for a healthy democracy, that are mm-hmm. good for fighting uh, global warming and racism and, 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 and poverty and, and so many problems. So I sort of felt like it wasn't enough just to say, oh, there's a rise of your religion and what's causing it, but to champion and, and trumpet the fact that this actually bodes very good for our society. That was one hole. And the other hole was um, that that really spurred me uh, with this book was, okay, look, I, I, as I said earlier, religion does a lot for a lot of people. I mean, it provides community. It helps people deal with the fear of death. It helps when they get cancer and, or their child gets cancer. It, it provides rituals and traditions. I mean, there's a lot that religion does. I mean, mm-hmm. there is a reason it's, it's so pervasive throughout human history and society to this day. So if we're seeing 20% of Americans now saying they have no religion, how are they getting these things? Mm-hmm. If at all, how, what do secular people do when they lose their leg in a car crash? What do secular people do when they want to teach their children morals and values? What do secular people do within the face with the reality of death? I mean, so all, I kind of wanted to look at all the things that religion does. So I guess what's new here is I'm, ta- I'm sort of approaching it sociological and, sociologically and anthropologically as opposed to philosophically. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but you know, a lot of the top bestsellers are sort of debating ideas, you know, like why religion is a bad idea, why it's flawed, why atheism is more rational, and that's wonderful, and I love it, and I assign it to my students, but the whole I saw was lived secularity. How does that look? Well, how does it function in people's everyday lives? That's Publishers not Weekly, as we tape this, Publishers Weekly actually released an article about how all of these newer books coming out about atheism, mm. like you're saying, mm. they're not about philosophy. They don't debate God's existence. Mm. They talk about lifestyle changes and how that affects exactly. us, practically speaking. So, yeah, this falls right in line with that. Yeah. Uh, I have let, to go write a book. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. There you go. <laughs> let me ask you a question that's uh, totally different from all of this. Um, if this were five years ago, people like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris, they were essentially at the top of the world when it came to atheism. Uh, they, If there were criticisms about them, it was, you know, their books. It was from the religious right. It was people who weren't happy with their books. But if you look now lately, those guys specifically have been under fire for, you know, things they've said inadvertently or not. Um, And it seems like there's a lot more criticism of not their books, but them as people, the arguments they make. Mm -hmm. Um, And I wonder, uh, the question I'm asking is, do you think at this point people like the new atheists, uh, at least those two specifically, are they helping or hurting the atheist cause? Uh, that's a tough question. It's a good question. I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say between the two, I, if I have to pick, helping. That doesn't mean they're also doing a little bit of harm and damage, but overwhelmingly, I mean, 
in truth, if I even look back at the development of my secular studies program, a lot can be said about you know these bestsellers. You know, Sam Harris's first book, Richard Dawkins, and Christopher Hitchens. I mean, those put this debate on the map across the spectrum. Suddenly, everybody was talking, well, these were bestsellers, so it must be important. Mm-hmm. And I, I am forever grateful for them. They, they, brought, you know, they brought this stuff. You know, before them, when I would assign stuff, I'm assigning like, you know, Bertrand Russell's Why I'm Not a Christian, Sigmund Freud's, you know, Future of Religion, I mean, stuff from, from earlier in the century. So I feel like they breathed new life into the whole issue, put a spotlight on it, gave people focus. So I think they've done so much good. They're so brilliant. They're so witty. They're so sharp. And, and I'm forever grateful. Now, now that here we are in 2014, and there's some criticisms of Richard Dawkins as a person or some things he's tweeted or said or whatever, Sam Harris, some things he's saying. Um, but most of the crit- criticisms I'm hearing from are, you know, from a sort of critiquing them for a sort of patriarchal or sexist uh, insensitivity. Mm. And all I can say to that is, hey, that's... That's a warrant. We need to hear those criticisms. We need to be vigilant about sexism and racism. It is hard to be a man and not internalize, you know, patriarchal sexist uh, notions. It is hard to be a white person and not internalize racist notions. We live in a patriarchal, uh, racist, classist society. It's almost impossible not for those things to get under our skin, no matter how much we wish they weren't. Mm -hmm. And when people call us out on it, all we need to do is say, you know, reflect, apologize, try to do better. And so I think some of the criticisms leveled at Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins on this front, you know, maybe they're a bit extreme, but maybe not. And I think what I would, so I would, I would think that, you know, in, in truth, I have to say when people looked at the, 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 the spokesman for atheism, they saw just that, white spokesman. Yeah. And our society is more diverse than it's ever been. Women are more uh, empowered than they've ever been. So there is something to be said to, hey, a movement like this should reflect the diversity of our nation and of our people. So there is, uh, you know, but, but I also feel like, you know, ad hominem attacks are, are not ideal. And I don't think we should ever reduce a person to their worst <laughs> things. With her worst tweets. <laughs> you know, we're, yeah, I mean, we're all human. I, I will say this, though. Um, you know, Ron Lindsay, who's involved in Center for Inquiry, uh, yeah. had some issues on this front. And some uh, saying, you know, at the first uh, Women in Secularism conference, he kind of went off and sort of talked to the women in a, in a patronizing way, and sort of some women got upset, and they called him out on it. And at first he kind of got defensive, but to his great credit, he apologized. I mean, that's all we can do. You know what? I'm so sorry. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. I need to think about this more. And I think that's a sort of warranted approach that I would encourage the great, you know, pillars of, of, of modern day atheism to, to consider, um, if they can, you know, who am I? I? I also don't want to be in the position of, you know, taking these guys down. They're, they're so successful. They've done so, so, so much for us, for, for the movement. So, um, I'm still sort of rooting for them, but, uh, they're only human, you know, yeah. let me, uh, we got a couple more questions for you. Uh, hopefully quick ones here. One is, <laughs> Uh, what have you uh, learned anything from your students when you're teaching these secular studies classes? Have they taught you something about atheism, humanism that you didn't know? Ah, oh, that's a really good one. That's a great question, man. Wow. And maybe it's just a change in demographic because you know these kids yeah. are 18. They're coming from maybe a very different place than mm-hmm. you know even yeah. Jessica and I came from too. Uh, yeah. Being so young, so I don't know. Have they have they shocked you in any way because <laughs> of their views? Okay, I would say one thing that I wasn't um, wasn't on my radar, and again, Jessica, this is here's your book idea. Yes. Ready? Just, just, <laughs> Wait, you no. know, just buy me a beer. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so basically, it's like this: the vast majority of people today who are atheists or agnostics or secular or whatnot were raised with some type of religion in their home. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was a watered down version. Maybe it was evangelical, maybe it was Mormon, but they had some religion in their life, and at some point they decided they didn't buy it, they didn't believe it, they broke away from it to varying degrees. What I'm getting at Pitzer is more and more students who were raised secular. Crazy. They, their parents were the ones who rejected religion. So these are 18-year-old, 19-year-old kids who were not raised with any religion at all. Yeah. It's, they are absolutely fascinating. So they haven't you know, shocked me, but they're teaching me about a demographic we know nothing about. And what I find with them is they, again, they're not angry at mm-hmm. religion. They're not hostile about it. 
they're kind of like, oh, I, you know, I, I know this exists. Right. It's a little <laughs> bit like it, they, they treat, they it, treat like it quaintly. Like Greek mythology. <laughs> they, they, yeah, they treat it like cricket. They're like, oh yeah, I've heard of rugby or cricket. <laughs> like, you know, like you know, I, that's interesting. I, I I never had a need to you know whack anything with a flat bat, but you know, <laughs> that's fine for you. So this is a demographic that I'm really enjoying. And that's um, interesting, Phil, thing- because um, I actually was really raised not atheist, but certainly without religion. And so whenever okay. I hear people like you said, how do you teach morals without religion? To me, that's such a silly uh, concept because I'm like, I don't know. Absolutely. I'm a reasonably moral person without religion. So whenever people kind of like... Like it managed to work just fine right, for me. Whenever people like wring <laughs> their hands and be like, oh, the morals, think of oh, the children. It, you are absolutely right. But I'm going to take it further. Not only does it seem to work fine, in many regards, it seems to work better. Yeah, good I job, mom and dad. <laughs> Yeah, I have a chapter in my book about secular morality, and I compare it to religious morality, not philosophically, but social. In other words, one of the studies show on indicators of morality it, it, from a host of ways to measure this. And what we find is that at root, theism is moral outsourcing. At root, mm-hmm. it is saying, I'm going to be obedient to some outside source of morality. Well, secular folks don't engage in moral outsourcing. They, they, they teach empathy, mm-hmm. and they live that way. And what we find is that, uh, uh, that secular morality actually functions better over the life course. So you, you, that's an awesome area. I, I just get so excited about that. Um, but yes, so uh, and the other thing I'd say I've learned about my students is they get tired of atheist critiques of theism pretty darn quickly. Yep. <laughs> In other words, you cannot sustain that for a semester. Yep. You cannot even, like, like the sort of, you know, so we go through the standard critiques of, of theism, you know, and, and after about three weeks, they're like, yeah, now, now what do you have to offer? Mm-hmm. They, they don't want to, they want to get to the good positive, stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, they, the criticism, they're not as excited. You know, it was very, it was far more radical, I think, in previous generations. Sure. It was far more volatile, scandalous even. That has lessened as religion's power is weakening and as secularism is rising. So the sort of like, you know, shock value of debunking, you know, faith in God is, is, is I think, toning down a bit. Mm. And now there's greater interest in church-state issues, greater interest in, well, how do secular people live their lives, that kind of thing. So that's I got, off the top of, yeah. I got one last question for you, which is when you give talks to a lay audience or you even give lectures to your students, is there any one thing you say about secularism or the changing demographics or something that just stops everyone in their tracks? They had no idea this was going on because they don't think about it or something? Wow. Um, other than the fact that studies show that secular women are far more likely to receive oral sex than religious women, <laughs> um, I cannot, you know, that, that's, a, that's a showstopper right there. Um, <laughs> that goes over well with the church audiences, I'm sure. Yeah, that, that, that always uh, gets, a, gets a good reaction, and it's true. Um, um, Who's doing science. these studies? I know. Science. It's the best. I think, I think what, I think what, what People, what seems to go over well again is 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 the real world data about the ways in which secular people uh, live their lives and and the indicators of the benefits, let's say, of secularity compared to religiosity. Uh, a lot of the audiences kind of eat that up because that just hasn't been trumpeted. You know, you can talk about sort of philosophically why atheism is superior to theism, and you can debunk. And, but but what what I love is studies that show. Okay, let's let's take this one. Uh, professors at Duke and USC did a meta-analysis of 55 different studies measuring racism among religious people. What was the main finding out of this 55 studies? That agnostics are the least racist people. Next come atheists. That secular people register lower levels of racism than religious people. It's not to say there aren't racist secular people. Of course there are. It's not to say that all religious people are racist. But on average, you're low, you're, you're, we're going to find lower levels of, of racism among the more secular. I mean, that kind of stuff is just people don't know. Yeah, um, that's awesome. I, lo- I love the you know I love the studies lately where there's been there's always studies that ask parents you know what traits do you want, most want to establish or foster in your children and they're given lists. Mm-hmm. And what you find is the more religious the parents, the more likely they are to put obedience to authority as number one. And, and the creativity more is at the end, right? 
Yeah, exactly. And then the more secular the parents are, the more likely obedience to authority is at the bottom, and thinking for oneself is at the top. So, I mean, there's just so much sort of tangible evidence out there that we raise our children well, we live moral lives, we contribute to a healthy democracy in ways that are unique and special and needed. So that's kind of... And there's always oral sex, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, thank you so much yeah, for joining us. Uh, oh, man, Phil's new pleasure. book. <laughs> Phil's new book is called "Living the Secular Life." We'll include a link uh, to the book uh, wherever we post this podcast. Phil, if you ever come to Chicago, I will absolutely buy you a beer. Oh man, this is I, a lot of fun. As, as you give too. Jessica tips on how to write a book. Yep. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Great. I look forward to it. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. This episode was taped at Cinnamon Sound Studios in Aurora, Illinois, and the music was written and performed by Brad Chagdis. If you like what you're hearing, please consider making a contribution at patreon.com slash hemant, that's he T. We appreciate your support. I'm Hemant Mehta. And I'm Jessica Blumke. We hope you'll join us next time.